by her. Of course. Why are you my friend? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, we are not friends, right? Uh, we don't see how. Okay, but the main reason I'm here is because I want to talk about this topic called Comic CSS. And if you haven't heard of it, uh, I'll touch on it later on. But uh, let me just get into it first. So I'm Sheldon. I work at SP uh, Singapore Power, as Chris mentioned. And uh, I work in the digital team. So this is what this we are. So I didn't come up with this title by myself, How to Use Atomic CSS and Sleep at Night. So I came across this article some time back. And uh, this is JavaScript, so I won't go too in-depth on it. But when ES6 classes were introduced into the language, it created a lot of like controversial controversy and like divided opinion. So I, I think once in the CSS world, one recent trend that I think is causing the similar uh, division is Atomic CSS. And uh, if you've seen Atomic CSS before, I think most people would probably be disgusted by it. So let me just get, show you how it looks like. Uh, anybody seen this before? Okay. Disgusted by it. Why is it always us? This is probably why we're running this. Me too. Great. So actually this kind of syntax comes, on, comes with a few names. La. So atomic, functional, I think this, the first two terms are quite uh, interchangeable. So last month at Talk CSS, Ed Moore from 90 Seconds had a talk on this as well. So he called it functional CSS. I call it atomic CSS. I think it's the more common term. And uh, there's another kind of atomic CSS that looks like this. So when I first saw this, right, I thought like, hey, this must be what the functional CSS is about, right? Because it looks like you're passing in arguments into functions. But guess what? It's not. It's called a CSS. Anybody wants to guess what that is? Wait, let me give you a clue. <laughs> Anybody want to guess now? It's actually called Atomic CSS. <laughs> And if you go to acss.io, it describes this technique where you actually write the classes like this in HTML, and something called the atomizer passes through HTML and generates the style sheets for you based on this cryptic syntax here. So if you take that approach, you don't even need to touch style sheets anymore. So I'm actually, I, don't stomach, I can't stomach this at the moment, so I haven't tried it yet. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit of a far, taken too far. La. Another article calls it programmatic atomic CSS, and I think that's a fair name. But for the rest of this talk, when I say atomic CSS, I'm not referring to this. <laughs> so, okay, how do you get here? Conventional CSS, I think if you're a front-end developer, you've probably heard of all the good best practices like object-oriented CSS, bare methodology, smacks, and they kind of advocate this approach where you create a, a panel, if you're creating a panel, just give it a name like panel and you put in the classes like this, right? So it's like component first naming methodology. What Atomic CSS advocates is doing it this way. Yeah, I, I heard somebody laugh already, so yeah, splitting up all the styles into individual classes, right? What happened to all the good practices of just creating a button class and then there's a different just button dash dash primary, right? So that's what Atomic CSS is about. La. So just taking it back to the beginning, how do we, oh wait. Mm, yeah, so a lot of big names in the web uh, industry has weighed in on this topic and yeah, there's like the most common uh, co criticism is like, how is it different from inline styles? It's like back to the dark days of web development and all that. So, how do we end up here? I think one way to look at it is that you can create 
your styles using on a scale from semantic to not semantic, right? So I think very long ago, a lot of us tried doing this. Content-based class naming. So if, you have an, if your designer gives you this thing called a, looks like a profile, so I call it a profile. And using some, some bad methodology, I call it profile, image, name, body, and all that. So far, it makes sense, right? The next day, your designer gives you this thing that looks like a profile component, but it's not. It's like a post or article. And now, you can't really use that same class again on this component because it's not semantic anymore. What you have is a post, you can't use profile on it, right? It's going to break your semantic uh, approach. So one way to deal with it is you could say, oh, I'm just going to create a post component, a post class with the exact same styles. Then it's not very dry anymore. And it's very easy for these two components, which look similar, to have like minor differences. If you accidentally change a font size or something, then uh, these two components, which are supposed to be similar, will look different. And that's probably not what your designer wanted. So that means this way of doing things is not reusable. So then go back and think about it, and hey, you probably need something that's Sorry, content agnostic. That Why yep. wouldn't you just rename the component to something that means something? Sorry, rename? So if it's not profile, it's not a post, why not mm. call it something else? Yeah, yeah. That's, so that's what I'm going to go on okay. to, actually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go back and think about it. I need something generic that applies to both classes, right? So there's something. There's another point in the middle that's like content agnostic. So you don't tie your class names to your content types anymore. So no profile, no uh, post or whatever. You go with something like media card. So this is based on the object-oriented CSS approach that Nicole Sullivan introduced to us. And so it's just changing one class name profile to media card, and then the name changed to title, and that's it, right? So pretty straightforward. And then now you have a usable class that applies for all scenarios. But what if one day your designer comes to you and he gives you a new post design or profile design and it's now different. Now they are different. So in the end, you still got to go back and refactor stuff. So this idea of separation of concerns where you put styling in CSS and instruction HTML, it's, it's never that clean. You can't really get away with uh, complete separation. So why not take it to the next level and look at atomic CSS? So I actually didn't, I didn't really like test out these classes, but it's I think it's just confusing enough that I think you get what I mean. So it's uh, using up all these tiny classes to create this and. One way to look at this scale, right? On the left, semantic, you have CSS that depends on HTML. That means your HTML defines what class names you use based on content, so profile, post, article, and what have you. And the other way, the other end of the spectrum is where HTML depends on CSS. So how that goes is you create your CSS classes and uh, the developer looks at these classes, uses these classes to build up the mockups that the designer hands over to them. Personally, I advocate a uh, approach somewhere on the between OCSS and Atomic, where you still keep using your old school conventional class names, but mix in with uh, utility classes for like spacing, alignment, and all that kind of thing. So, how I'm doing this at where I am now. I think most of you probably have done uh, styles like this before. So if you actually think about it, this is actually an evolution of uh, OCSS. Utility classes, like they call it. Then eventually my uh, developers take my, so okay, just a quick story again. When I joined SP, my first task was to create a UI library. And this is going to be used across multiple Rails projects. Uh, so these Rails developers slash full stack slash backend developers, they don't really care about CSS. They don't really care what conventions you use, what naming, 
uh, styles you use, how, how you build your architecture. What they want is predictable changes. They want classes that can add and remove with predictable results. So that got me thinking like, maybe the atomic uh, CSS approach is not too bad after all. So I first started with classes like this, so just margins, and eventually it became, uh, it compiles to this on the right. Then they wanted more. They wanted like uh, styles that work on multiple breakpoints. They want padding, they want margin, they want the whole lot. And that led me to creating this fancy thing. So this mixin is a breakpoint all mixin. Uh, let me just show you how it looks like. Uh. So over here, I'm passing in like sizes, right, based on this. So I'm basically creating a, a style for every unit of margin and padding for every breakpoint you could think of. And total, I ended up with 3,480 lines, <laughs> including the spacing in between. And if you think that's bad, look at uh, so I generate the bundle CSS, right? And I search for media, and I get 442, uh, 498 instances of it. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a downfall to this, or rather a catch to this approach. La. But guess what? There's this thing called me, MQ Packer on NPM. What it does, it, it aggregates all these different breakpoints, and it combines all the classes into the different breakpoints. So there are some caveats to that, but Basically, this is what ended up my bundle size reduced by quite a bit. And now I have only four media breakpoints. Of course, this is a uh, minify and all that, but as you can see, it's like all crushed together now. And uh, yeah, so this is what my developers look at. It's like a kind of like a style guide thing, which they use uh, to, to style their uh, websites. So I guess uh, what I want, to, what I want to take away from here is that atomic CSS is not all that bad. There are some good parts to it. It's not an all or nothing approach. So I didn't look at Tachyon, Tachyons and say, hey, this looks like a good idea and I should try using it. Uh, the way I've done it came about from the working environment I'm in and it just evolved over time as a, as a necessity. Uh. And you should probably use it with a conventional approach. So I'd say uh, just build your components the same way you do now, like a BAM or what have you. And then you do the spacings with object-oriented CSS. So margins, paddings, basically laying out uh, the components on the, on the page. La. So you use that along with your grid, your grid uh, styling that you probably are using already. And if you want to try, you can take, a, take a, something like Tachyons and then start using that from the start before abstracting out patterns that, you come, that come across that appear after uh, you've done your, like a, few, a few pages. Then extract all those multiple classes into a proper component after that. And in the end, it might not work for you and that's fine. So. I think Atomic CSS works better in a larger scale project with multiple developers. So I used to work in an agency before and I think uh, the kind of projects that are handled there are small, small enough and short time frame enough that you don't really have to maintain stuff afterwards and uh, you can get away with pretty much any approach in that case, whether it's a BAM, SMAX, so CSS and all that. So I think I'd like to leave you with a quote. You can't predict the future. That's why you should always favor composition over inheritance. So I just want to read right away that I'm not advocating the all-in tachyon CSS style, but rather take the best parts of atomic CSS, like the way I'm using now is like spacing utilities, and try it in your projects. And maybe you'll find that it's pretty useful after all. So thanks for your time. 
Any questions? Questions? I'm not yes. You. Okay. Nice. <laughs> you said good things about Atomic CSS. And mm -hmm. We promise to be civil. Any questions? Anyone? So, you, are you still the primary maintainer of CSS uh, SP? Yes. Okay. Pretty much the only maintainer for the past <laughs> eight months. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, do we have announcements? Does yeah, anybody? Yeah, announcement. yeah. As always, oh, okay. the obligatory we are hiring page. Yeah. Perpetually hiring. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I so late, uh, I, I typed. I am really confused. I'm just hiring. Is there any hiring anyone? Yeah. Yeah, I just let me or Michael here, my colleague. Or you could throw a stone and just hit a random SP engineer walking around Singapore all day. Anyway, so sorry. It's not that bad. Yeah, I'll post all these references on Twitter. Before we know all that stuff. What do we have? Okay, you see. Okay, can.